Augustus stuck the money back in his pocket. I ought to know better than to try and buy conversation, he said, still grinning. Let's go down and play some cards. Chapter 4 When Augustus left Call, sitting on the steps, he took a slow stroll through the wagon yard and down the street, stopping for a moment on the sandy bottom of Hat Creek to strap on his pistol. The night was quiet as sleep, no night when he expected to have to shoot anybody, but it was only wise to have the pistol handy in case he had to whack a drunk. It was an old Colt Dragoon with a seven-inch barrel, and, as he was fond of saying, weighed about as much as the leg he strapped it to. One whack would usually satisfy most drunks, and two whacks would drop an ox, if Augustus cared to put his weight into it. The border knights had qualities that he had come to admire, different as they were from the qualities of knights in Tennessee. In Tennessee, as he remembered, knights tended to get mushy, with a cottony mist drifting into the hollows. Border nights were so dry you could smell the dirt, and clear as dew. In fact, the nights were so clear it was tricky. Even with hardly any moon, the stars were bright enough that every bush and fence post cast a shadow. P.I., who had a jumpy disposition, was always shying from shadows, and he had even blazed away at innocent chaparral bushes on occasion, mistaking them for bandits. Augustus was not particularly nervous, but even so, he had hardly started down the street before he got a scare. A little ball of shadow ran right at his feet. He jumped sideways, fearing snake bite, although his brain knew snakes didn't roll like balls. Then he saw an armadillo hustle past his feet. Once he saw what it was, he tried to give it a kick to teach it not to walk in the street scaring people but the armadillo hurried right along as if it had as much right to the street as a banker. The town was not roaring with people, nor was it bright with lights, though a light was on at the Pumphreys, whose daughter was about to have a baby. The Pumphreys ran a store. The baby their daughter was expecting would arrive in the world to find itself fatherless, since the boy who had married the Pumphrey girl had drowned in the Republican River in the fall of the year, with the girl only just pregnant. There was only one horse hitched outside the dry bean when Augustus strolled up, a rangy sorrel that he recognized as belonging to a cowboy named Dishwater Boggett, so named because he had once rushed into camp so thirsty from a dry drive that he wouldn't wait his turn at the water barrel and had filled up on some dishwater the cook had been about to throw out. Seeing the sorrel gave Augustus a prime feeling because Dish Boggett loved card playing, though he lacked even minimal skills. Of course, he also probably lacked anti-money, but that didn't necessarily rule out a game. Dish was a good hand and could always get hired. Augustus didn't mind playing for futures with such a man. When he stepped in the door, everybody was looking peeved, probably because Lippy was banging away at My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, a song that he loved to excess and played as if he hoped it could be heard in the capital of Mexico. Xavier once, the little Frenchman who owned the place, was nervously wiping his tables with a wet rag. Xavier seemed to think keeping the tables well wiped was the crucial factor in his business, though Augustus was often forced to point out to him that such a view was nonsense. Most of the patrons of the dry bean were so lacking in fastidiousness that they wouldn't have noticed a dead skunk on the tables, much less a few crumbs and spilled drinks. Xavier himself had a near monopoly on fastidiousness in Lonesome Dove. He wore a white shirt the year round, clipped his little mustache once a week, and even wore a bow tie, or at least a black shoestring that did its best to serve as a bow tie. Some cowpoke had swiped Xavier's last real bow tie, probably meaning to try and impress some girl somewhere up the trail. Since the shoestring was limp and not stiff like a bow tie should be, it merely added to the melancholy of Xavier's appearance, which would have been melancholy enough without it. He had been born in New Orleans and had ended up in Lonesome Dove because someone had convinced him Texas was the land of opportunity. Though he soon discovered otherwise, he was too proud or too fatalistic to attempt to correct his mistake. He approached day-to-day -day life in the dry bean with a resigned temper, which on occasion stopped being resigned and became explosive. When it exploded, the placid air was apt to be rent by Creole curses. 
Good evening, my good friend, Augustus said. He said it with as much gravity as he could muster, since Xavier appreciated a certain formality. In return, Xavier nodded stiffly. It was hard to extend the amenities when Lippy was at the height of a performance. Dish Boggett was sitting at one of the tables with Lorena, hoping to persuade her to give him a poke on credit. Though Dish was barely twenty-two, he wore a walrus mustache that made him look years older than he was, and much more solemn. In color, the mustache was stuck between yellow and brown, kind of prairie dog colored, Augustus thought. He frequently suggested to Dish that if he wanted to eat prairie dog, he ought to remember to pick his teeth, a reference to the mustache whose subtlety was lost on Dish. Lorena had her usual look, the look of a woman who was somewhere else. She had a fine head of blonde hair, whose softness alone set her apart in a country where most women's hair had a consistency not much softer than saddle strings. Her cheeks hollowed a little. It gave her a distracting beauty. Augustus's experience had taught him that hollow-cheeked beauty was a dangerous kind. His two wives had both been fat-cheeked and trustworthy but had possessed little resistance to the climate. One had expired of pleurisy in only the second year of their marriage, while the other had been carried off by scarlet fever after the seventh. But the woman Lorena put him most in mind of was Clara Allen, whom he had loved hardest and deepest, and still loved. Clara's eyes were direct and sparkled with interest, whereas Lorena's were always side-looking. Still, there was something about the girl that reminded him of Clara, who had chosen a stolid horse trader when she decided to marry. Ah, God, Dish, he said, going over to the table. I never expected to see you loafing down here in the south this time of the year. Loan me two dollars, Gus, Dish said. Not me, Augustus said. Why would I loan money to a loafer? You ought to be trailing cattle by this time of year. I'll be leaving next week to do just that, Dish said. Loan me two dollars, and I'll pay you in the fall. Unless you drown or get stomped or shoot somebody and get hung, Augustus said. No, sir. Too many perils ahead. Anyway, I've known you to be sly, Dish. You've probably got two dollars and just don't want to spend it. Lippy finished his concert and came and joined them. He wore a brown bowler hat he had picked up on the road to San Antonio some years before. Either it had blown out of a stagecoach, or the Indians had snatched some careless drummer and not bothered to take his hat. At least, those were the two theories Lippy had worked out in order to explain his good fortune in finding the hat. In Augustus's view, the hat would have looked better blowing around the country for two years than it did at present. Lippy only wore it when he played the piano. When he was just gambling or sitting around attending to the leak from his stomach, he frequently used the hat for an ashtray, and then sometimes forgot to empty the ashes before putting the hat back on his head. He only had a few strips of stringy gray hair hanging off his skull, and the ashes didn't make them look much worse, but ashes represented only a fraction of the abuse the bowler had suffered. It was also Lippy's pillow, and it had so many things spilled on it or in it that Augustus could hardly look at it without gagging. That hat looks about like a buffalo cud, Augustus said. A hat ain't meant to be a chamber pot, you know. If I was you, I'd throw it away. Lippy was so named because his lower lip was about the size of the flap on a saddlebag. He could tuck enough snuff under it to last a normal person at least a month. In general, the lip lived a life of its own, there toward the bottom of his face. Even when he was just sitting quietly studying his cards, the lip waved and wiggled as if it had a breeze blowing across it, which, in fact, it did. Lippy had something wrong with his nose, and breathed with his mouth wide open. Accustomed as she was to hard doings, it had still taken Lorena a while to get used to the way Lippy slurped when he was eating. And she had once had a dream in which a cowboy walked by Lippy and buttoned the lip to his nose as if it were the flap of a pocket. But her disgust was nothing compared to Xavier's, who suddenly stopped wiping tables and came over and grabbed Lippy's hat off his head. Xavier was in a bad mood, and his features quivered like those of a trapped rabbit. Disgrace! I won't have this hat! Who can eat? Xavier said, though nobody was trying to eat. He took the hat around the bar and flung it out the back door. Once as a boy, he had carried slops in a restaurant in New Orleans that actually used tablecloths, a standard of excellence which haunted him still. 
Every time he looked at the bare tables in the dry bean, he felt a failure. Instead of having tablecloths, the tables were so rough you could get a splinter just running your hand over them. Also, they weren't attractively round, since the cowboys could not be prevented from whittling on their edges. Over the years, sizable chunks had been whittled off, giving most of the tables an unbalanced look. He himself had a linen tablecloth, which he brought out once a year, on the anniversary of the death of his wife. His wife had been a bully, and he didn't miss her, but it was the only occasion sufficient to provide an excuse for the use of a tablecloth in Lonesome Dove. His wife, whose name had been Therese, had bullied horses, too, which is why his team had run off and flung themselves and the buggy into a gully, the buggy landing right on top of Therese. At the annual dinner in her honor, Xavier proved that he was still a restaurateur of discipline by getting drunk without spilling a drop on the fine tablecloth. Augustus was the only one invited to the dinners, but he only came every three or four years out of politeness. Not only were the occasions mournful and silly, everyone in Lonesome Dove had been glad to see the last of Therese, they were mildly dangerous. Augustus was neither as disciplined a drinker as Xavier, nor as particular about the tablecloths either. And he knew that if he spilled liquor on the precious linen, the situation would end badly. He would not likely have to shoot Xavier, but it might be necessary to whack him on the head, and Augustus hated to hit such a small head with such a large pistol. To Xavier's mind, Lippy's hat was the final exacerbation. No man of dignity would allow such a hat in his establishment, much less on the head of an employee. So from time to time he seized it and flung it out the door. Perhaps a goat would eat it. They were said to eat worse, but the goats ignored the hat, and Lippy always went out and retrieved it when he remembered that he needed an ashtray. Disgrace, Xavier said again in a somewhat happier tone. Lippy was unperturbed. What's wrong with that hat, he asked. It was made in Philadelphia. It says so inside it. It did say so, but Augustus, not Lippy, was the one who had originally made the point. Lippy could not have read a word as big as Philadelphia, and he had only the vaguest notion of where the city was. All he knew was that it must be a safe and civilized place if they had time to make hats instead of fighting Comanches. Xavier, I'll make you a deal, Augustus said. Loan dish here two dollars, so we can get a little game going, and I'll rake that hat into the toe sack and carry it home to my pigs. It's the only way you'll ever get rid of it. If you wear it again, I will burn it, Xavier said, still inflamed. I will burn the whole place. Then where will you go? If you want to burn that pianer, you best have a swift mule waiting, Lippy said, his lip undulating as he spoke. The church folks won't like it. Dish found the conversation a burden to listen to. He had delivered a small horse herd in Matamoros and had ridden nearly a hundred miles upriver with Lori in mind. It was funny he would do it since the thought of her scared him, but he had just kept riding and here he was. He mainly did his sporting with Mexican whores, but now and then he found he wanted a change from small brown women. Lorena was so much of a change that at the thought of her his throat clogged up and he lost his ability to talk. He had already been with her four times and had a vivid memory of how white she was, moon pale and touched with shadows like the night outside. Only not like the night exactly. He could ride through the night peacefully, and a ride with Lorena was not peaceful. She used some cheap powder, a souvenir of her city living, and the smell of it seemed to follow Dish for weeks. He didn't like just paying her, though, it seemed to him it would be better if he brought her a fine present from Abilene or Dodge. He could get away with that with the senoritas. They liked the idea of presents to look forward to, and Dish was careful never to renege. He always came back from Dodge with ribbons and combs. But somehow he could not get up the nerve even to make the suggestion to Lorena. It was hard enough to make a plain business offer. Often she seemed not to hear questions when they were put to her, it was hard to make a girl realize you had special feelings for her when she wouldn't look at you, didn't hear you, and made your throat clog up. It was even harder to live with the thought that the girl in question didn't want you to have the special feelings, particularly if you were about to go up the trail and not see her for many months. 
Confusing as these feelings were, they were made even worse for Dish by the realization that he couldn't afford even the transaction that the girl would accept. He was down to his last two bits, having lost a full month's wages in a game in Matamoros. He had no money and no eloquence with which to persuade Lorena to trust him, but he did have a dogged persistence and was prepared to sit in the dry bean all night in hope that his evident need would finally move her. Under the circumstances, it was a sore trial to Dish that Augustus had come in. It seemed to him that Laurie had been getting a little friendlier, and if nothing had happened to distract her, he might soon have prevailed. At least it had been just him and her at the table, which had been nice in itself. But now it was him and her and Augustus and Lippy making it difficult, if not impossible, for him to plead his case, though all he had really been doing by way of pleading was to look at her frequently with big, hopeful eyes. Lippy began to feel unhappy about the fact that Xavier had thrown his hat out the door. Augustus's mention of the pigs put the whole matter in a more ominous light. After all, the pigs might come along and eat the hat, which was one of the solidest comforts in his meager existence. He would have liked to go and retrieve the hat before the pigs came along, but he knew that it wasn't really wise to provoke Xavier unduly when he was in a bad mood anyway. He couldn't see out the back door because the bar was in the way. For all he knew, the hat might already be gone. I wish I could get back to St. Louis, he said. I hear it's a right busy town. He had been reared there, and when his heart was heavy, he returned to it in his thoughts. Why, hell, go, Augustus said. Life's a short affair. Why spend it here? Well, you are, Dish said in a surly tone, hoping Gus would take the hint and set out immediately. Dish, you sound like you've got a sour stomach, Augustus said. What you need is a good, satisfying game of cards. Nothing of the kind, Dish said, casting a bold and solicitous glance at Lorena. Looking at her, though, was like looking at the hills. The hills stayed as they were. You could go to them if you had the means, but they extended no greeting. Xavier stood at the door, staring into the dark. The rag he used to wipe the tables was dripping onto his pants leg, but he didn't notice. It's too bad nobody in town ain't dead, Augustus remarked. This group has the makings of a first-rate funeral party. What about you, Wants? Let's play cards. Xavier acquiesced. It was better than nothing. Besides, he was a devilish good card player, one of the few around who was a consistent match for Augustus. Lorena was competent. Tinkersley had taught her a little. When the dry bean was full of cowboys, she was not allowed to sit in. But on nights when the clientele consisted of Augustus, she often played. When she played, she changed, particularly if she won a little. Augustus frequently did his best to help her win a little, just to see the process take place. The child in her was briefly reborn. She didn't chatter, but she did occasionally laugh out loud, and her cloudy eyes cleared and became animated. Once in a while, when she won a really good pot, she would give Augustus a little punch with her fist. It pleased him when that happened. It was good to see the girl enjoying herself. It put him in mind of family games, the kind he had once played with his lively sisters in Tennessee. The memory of those games usually put him to drinking more than he liked to, and all because Laurie ceased being a sulky whore for a little while and reminded him of happy girls he had once known. They played until the rustler's moon had crossed to the other side of town. Lorena brightened so much that Dish Boggett fell worse in love with her than ever. She filled him with such an ache that he didn't mind that Xavier won half of his next month's wages. The ache was very much with him when he finally decided there was no hope and stepped out into the moonlight to unhitch his horse. Augustus had come with him while Lippy sneaked out the back door to retrieve his hat, the light in Lorena's room came on while they were standing there, and Dish looked up at it, catching just her shadow as she passed in front of the lamp. Well, Dish, so you're leaving us, Augustus said. Which outfit's lucky enough to have you this trip? The quick glimpse of Lorena put Dish in such perplexity of spirit that he could hardly focus on the question. Well, I'm going up with the W's, he said, his eyes still on the window. The cause of Dish's melancholy was not lost on Augustus. Why, that's Shanghai Pierce's bunch, he said. Yep, Dish said, starting to lift his foot to his stirrup. Now hold on a minute, Dish, Augustus said. 
He fished in his pocket and came out with two dollars, which he handed to the surprised cowboy. If you're riding north with old Shang, we may never meet again this side of the Bourne, Augustus said, deliberately adopting the elegiac tone. At the very least, you'll get your hearing ruined. That voice of his could deafen a rock. Dish had to smile. Gus seemed unaware that one of the more persistent topics of dispute on the Texas range was whether his voice was louder than Shanghai Pierce's. It was commonly agreed that the two men had no close rivals when it came to being deafening. Why'd you give me this money? Dish asked. He had never been able to figure Gus out. You asked me for it, didn't you? Augustus said. If I'd have given it to you before the game started, I might as well have handed it to once. And he don't need no two dollars of mine. There was a pause while Dish tried to puzzle out the real motive, if there was one. I'd not want it thought I'd refuse a simple loan to a friend, Augustus said, especially not one who's going off with Shanghai Pierce. Oh, Mr. Pierce don't go with us, Dish said. He goes over to New Orleans and takes the train. Augustus said nothing, and Dish soon concluded that he was to get the loan, even if the aggravation of Mr. Pierce's company wasn't involved. Well, much obliged, then, Dish said. I'll see you in the fall, if not sooner. There's no need for you to ride off tonight, Augustus said. You can throw your blanket down on our porch if you like. I might do that, Dish said. Feeling rather awkward, he rehitched his horse and went to the door of the dry bean, wanting to get upstairs before Lori turned off her light. I believe I left something, he said lamely at the door of the saloon. Well, I won't wait, Dish, Augustus said, but we'll expect you for breakfast if you care to stay. As he strolled away, he heard the boy's footsteps hitting the stairs at the back of the saloon. Dish was a good boy, not much less green than Newt, though a more experienced hand. Best to help such boys have their moment of fun before life's torments snatched them. From a distance, standing in the pale street, he saw two shadows against the yellow box of light from Laurie's room. She wasn't that set against Dish, it seemed to him and she had been pepped up from the card-playing. Maybe even Laurie would be surprised and find a liking for the boy. Occasionally he had known sporting women to marry and do well at it. If Laurie were so inclined, Dish Boggett would not be a bad man to settle on. The light had gone off at the Pumphreys, and the armadillo was no longer there to roll its shadow at him. The pigs were stretched out on the porch, lying practically snout to snout. Augustus was about to kick them off to make room for the guest he more or less expected. But they looked so peaceful, he relented and went around to the back door. If Dish Boggett, with his prairie dog of a mustache, considered himself too refined to throw his bedroll beside two fine pigs, then he could rout them out himself. Chapter 5 Whatever subject Augustus had on his mind when he went to bed was generally still sitting there when he woke up. He was such a short sleeper that the subject had no time to slip out of his mind. Five hours was as much as he ever slept at a stretch, and four hours was more nearly his average. A man that sleeps all night wastes too much of life, he often said. As I see it, the days was made for looking and the nights for sport since sport was what he had been brooding about when he got home, it was still in his thoughts when he arose, which he did about 4 a.m. to see to the breakfast, in his view too important a meal to entrust to a Mexican bandit. The heart of his breakfast was a plentitude of sourdough biscuits, which he cooked in a Dutch oven out in the backyard. His pot dough had been perking along happily for over ten years, and the first thing he did upon rising was check it out. The rest of the breakfast was secondary, just a matter of whacking off a few slabs of bacon and frying a panful of pullet eggs. Bolivar could generally be trusted to deal with the coffee. Augustus cooked his biscuits outside for three reasons. One was because the house was sure to heat up well enough anyway during the day, so there was no point in building any more of a fire than was necessary for bacon and eggs. Two was because biscuits cooked in a Dutch oven tasted better than stove-cooked biscuits, and three was because he liked to be outside to catch the first light. A man that depended on an indoor cook stove would miss the sunrise, and if he missed sunrise in Lonesome Dove, he would have to wait out a long stretch of heat and dust before he got to see anything so pretty. 
Augustus molded his biscuits and went out and got a fire going in the Dutch oven while it was still good dark, just enough of a fire to freshen up his bed of mesquite coals. When he judged the oven was ready, he brought the biscuits and his Bible out in the backyard. He set the biscuits in the oven and sat down on a big black kettle that they used on the rare occasions when they rendered lard. The kettle was big enough to hold a small mule if anybody had wanted to boil one, but for the last few years it had remained upside down, making an ideal seat. The eastern sky was red as coals in a forge, lighting up the flats along the river. Dew had wet the million needles of the chaparral, and when the rim of the sun edged over the horizon, the chaparral seemed to be spotted with diamonds. A bush in the backyard was filled with little rainbows as the sun touched the dew. It was tribute enough to sun up that it could make even chaparral bushes look beautiful, Augustus thought, and he watched the process happily, knowing it would only last a few minutes. The sun spread reddish gold light through the shining bushes, among which a few goats wandered, bleating. Even when the sun rose above the low bluffs to the south, a layer of light lingered for a bit at the level of the chaparral, as if independent of its source. Then the sun lifted clear like an immense coin. The dew quickly died, and the light that filled the bushes like red dust dispersed, leaving clear, slightly bluish air. It was good reading light by then, so Augustus applied himself for a few minutes to the prophets. He was not overly religious, but he did consider himself a fair prophet, and liked to study the styles of his predecessors. They were mostly too long-winded in his view, and he made no effort to read them verse for verse. He just had a look here and there while the biscuits were browning. While he was enjoying a verse or two of Amos, the pigs walked around the corner of the house, and Call, at almost the same moment, stepped out the back door, pulling on his shirt. The pigs walked over and stood directly in front of Augustus. The dew had wet their blue coats. They know I've got a soft heart, he said to Call, they're hoping I'll feed them this Bible. I hope you pigs didn't wake up Dish, he added, for he had checked and seen that Dish was there, sleeping comfortably with his head on his saddle and his hat over his eyes, only his big mustache showing. To Carl's regret, he had never been able to come awake easily. His joints felt like they were filled with glue, and it was an irritation to see Augustus sitting on the black kettle, looking as fresh as if he'd slept all night, when in fact he had probably played poker till one or two o'clock. Getting up early and feeling awake was the one skill he had never truly perfected. He got up, of course, but it never felt natural. Augustus laid down the Bible and walked over to look at Call's wound. I ought to slop some more axle grease on it, he said. It's a nasty bite. You tend to your biscuits, Call said. What's Dish Boggett doing here? I didn't ask the man his business, Augusta said. If you die of gangrene, you'll be sorry you didn't let me dress that wound. It ain't a wound, it's just a bite, Call said. I was bit worse by bedbugs down in Sotillo that time. I suppose you set up reading the good book all night. Not me, Augusta said. I only read it in the morning and the evening when I can be reminded of the glory of the Lord. The rest of the day I'm just reminded of what a miserable stink hole we stuck ourselves in. It's hard to have fun in a place like this, but I do my best. He went over and put his hand on top of the Dutch oven. It felt to him like the biscuits were probably ready, so he took them out. They had puffed up nicely and were a healthy brown. He took them quickly into the house and call followed. Newt was at the table, sitting straight upright, a knife in one hand and a fork in the other, but sound asleep. We come to this place to make money, Call said. Nothing about fun was in the deal. Call, you don't even like money, Augusta said. You'd spit in the eye of every rich man you ever met. You like money even less than you like fun, if that's possible. Call sighed and sat down at the table. Bolivar was up and stumbling around the stove, shaking so that he spilled coffee grounds on the floor. Wake up, Newt, Augusta said. If you don't, you'll fall over and stick yourself in the eye with your own fork. Call gave the boy a little shake and his eyes popped open. I was having a dream, Newt said, sounding very young. You're tough luck then, son, Augusta said. Morning around here is more like a nightmare. Now look what's happened. In an effort to get the coffee going, Bolivar had spilled a small pile of coffee grounds into the grease where the eggs and bacon were frying. 
It seemed a small enough matter to him, but it enraged Augustus, who liked to achieve an orderly breakfast at least once a week. I guess it won't hurt the coffee none to taste like eggs, he said testily. Most of the time your eggs taste like coffee. I don't care, Bolivar said. I feel sick. P.I. came stumbling through about that time, trying to get his pizzle out of his pants before his bladder started to flood. It was a frequent problem. The pants he wore had about 15 small buttons, and he got up each morning and buttoned every one of them before he realized he was about to piss. Then he would come rushing through the kitchen trying to undo the buttons. The race was always close, but usually P would make it to the back steps before the flood commenced. Then he would stand there and splatter the yard for five minutes or so. When he could hear sizzling grease in one ear and the sound of P.I. pissing in the other, Augustus knew that the peace of the morning was over once again. If a woman ever stumbled onto this outfit at this hour of the day, she'd screech and poke out her eyes, Augustus said. At that point, someone did stumble onto it, but only Dish Boggett, who had always been responsive to the smell of frying bacon. It was a surprise to Newt, who immediately snapped awake and tried to get his cowlick to lay down. Dish Boggett was one of his heroes, a real cowboy who had been up the trail all the way to Dodge City more than once. It was Newt's great ambition to go up the trail with a herd of cattle. The sight of Dish gave him hope, for Dish wasn't somebody totally out of reach like the captain. Newt didn't imagine that he could ever be what the captain was, but Dish seemed not that much different from himself. He was known to be a top hand, and Newt welcomed every chance to be around him. He liked to study the way Dish did things. Morning, Dish, he said. Why, howdy there, Dish said, and went to stand beside P.I. and attend to the same business. It perked Newt up that Dish didn't treat him like a kid. Someday, if he was lucky, maybe he and Dish would be cowboys together. Newt could imagine nothing better. Augustus had fried the eggs hard as marbles to compensate for the coffee grains, and when they looked done to him, he poured the grease into the big three-gallon syrup can they used for a grease bucket. It's poor table manners to piss in hearing of those at the table, he said, directing his remarks to the gentleman on the porch. You two are grown men. What would your mothers think? Dish looked a little sheepish, whereas P was merely confused by the question. His mother had passed away in Georgia when he was only six. She had not had time to give him much training before she died, and he had no idea what she might think of such an action. However, he was sure she would not have wanted him to go in his pants. I had to hurry, he said. Howdy, Captain, Dish said. Call nodded. In the morning, he had the advantage of Gus, since Gus had to cook. With Gus cooking, he got his choice of the eggs and bacon, and a little food always brought him to life and made him consider all the things that ought to be done during the day. The Hat Creek outfit was just a small operation, with just enough land under lease to graze small lots of cattle and horses until buyers could be found. It amazed Call that such a small operation could keep three grown men and a boy occupied from sunup until dark, day after day, but such was the case. The barn and corrals had been in such poor shape when he and Gus bought the place that it took constant work just to keep them from total collapse. There was nothing important to do in Lonesome Dove, but that didn't mean there was enough time to keep up with the little things that needed doing. They had been six weeks sinking a new well, and were still far from deep enough. When Call raked the eggs and bacon onto his plate, such a crowd of possible tasks rushed into his mind that he was a minute responding to Dish's greetings. Oh, hello, Dish, he said finally. Have some bacon. Dish is planning to shave his mustache right after breakfast, Augustus said. He's getting tired of living without women. In fact, with the aid of Gus's two dollars, Dish had been able to prevail on Lorena. He had awakened on the porch with a clear head. But when Augustus mentioned women, he remembered it all and suddenly felt weak with love. He had been keenly hungry when he sat down at the table, his mouth watering for the eggs and fry back. But the thought of Lorena's white body, or the portion of it he had got to see when she lifted her nightgown, made him almost dizzy for a moment. He continued to eat, but the food had lost its taste. The blue shoat came to the door and looked in at the people, to Augustus's amusement. Look at that, he said. A pig watching a bunch of human pigs. 
Though he had been out-positioned at the frying pan, he was in prime shape to secure his share of the biscuits, half a dozen of which he had already sopped in honey and consumed. Throw that pig them egg shells, he said to Bolivar. He's starving. I don't care, Bolivar said, sucking coffee-colored sugar out of a big spoon. I feel sick. You're repeating yourself, Bal, Augustus said. If you're planning on dying today, I hope you dig your grave first. Bolivar looked at him sorrowfully. So much talk in the morning gave him a headache to go with his shakes. If I dig a grave, it will be yours, he said simply. Going up the trail, Dish? Newt asked, hoping to turn the conversation to more cheerful matters. I hope to, Dish said. It would take a hacksaw to cut these eggs, Call said. I've seen bricks that was softer. Well, Ball spilled coffee in them, Augusta said. I expect it was hard coffee. Call finished the rock-like eggs and gave Dish the once-over. He was a lank fellow, loose-built, and a good rider. Five or six more like him, and they could make up a herd themselves and drive it north. The idea had been in his mind for a year or more. He had even mentioned it to Augustus, but Augustus merely laughed at him. We're too old, Call, he said. We've forgot everything we need to know. You may have, Call said. I ain't. Seeing Dish put Call in mind of his idea again. He was not eager to spend the rest of his life on well digging or barn repair. If they made up a fair herd and did well with it, they would make enough to buy some good land north of the brush country. Are you signed to go with someone then? He asked Dish. Oh no, I ain't signed on, Dish said. But I've gone before and I imagine Mr. Pierce will hire me again. Or if not him, someone else. We might give you work right here, Call said. That got Augustus's attention. Give him work doing what, he asked. Dish here's a top hand. He don't cotton to work that requires walking, do you, Dish? I don't for a fact, Dish said, looking at the captain, but seeing Lorena. I've done a mess of it, though. What did you have in mind? Well, we're going down to Mexico tonight, Call said, going to see what we can raise. We might make up a herd ourselves if you wanted to wait a day or two while we look it over. That mare bites drove you crazy, Augustus said. Make up a herd and do what with it? Drive it, Call said. Well, we might drive it over to Pickles Gap, I guess, Augustus said. That ain't enough work to keep a hand like Dish occupied for the summer. Call got up and carried his dishes to the wash tub. Bolivar wearily got off his stool and picked up the water bucket. I wish Dietz would come back, he said. Dietz was a black man. He had been with Cal and Augustus nearly as long as P.I. Three days before, he had been sent to San Antonio with a deposit of money, a tactic Call always used, since few bandits would suspect a black man of having any money on him. Bolivar missed him because one of Dietz's jobs was to carry water. He'll be back this morning, Call said. You can set your clock by Dietz. You might set yours, Augustus said. I wouldn't set mine. Old Dietz is human. If he ever run into the right dark-complexioned lady, you might have to wind your clock two or three times before he showed up. He's like me. He knows that some things are more important than work. Bolivar looked at the water bucket with irritation. I'd like to shoot this damn bucket full of holes, he said. I don't think you could hit that bucket if you was sitting on it, Augustus said. I've seen you shoot. You ain't the worst shot I ever knew. That would be Jack Jennel. But you run him a close race. Jack went broke as a buffalo hunter quicker than any man I ever knew. He couldn't have hit a buffalo if one had swallowed him. Bolivar went out the door with the bucket, looking as if it might be a while before he came back. Dish, meanwhile, was doing some hard thinking. He had meant to leave right after breakfast and ride back to the Matagorda, where he had a sure job. The Hat Creek outfit was hardly known as a trail-driving bunch, but on the other hand, Captain Call was not a man to indulge in idle talk. If he was contemplating a drive, he would probably make one. Meanwhile, there was Lorena, who might come to see him in an entirely different light if he could spend time with her for a few days running. Of course, getting to spend time with her was expensive, and he had not a cent. But if word got around that he was working for the Hat Creek outfit, he could probably attract a little credit. One thing Dish prided himself on was his skill at driving a buggy. It occurred to him that since Lorena seemed to spend most of her time cooped up in the dry bean, she might appreciate a buggy ride along the river in a smart buggy, if such a creature could be found in Lonesome Dove. 
He got up and carried his plate to the wash bucket. Captain, if you mean it, I'd be pleased to stay the day or two, Dish said. The captain had stepped out on the back porch and was looking north along the stage road that threaded its way through the brush country toward San Antonio. The road ran straight for a considerable distance before it hit the first gully, and Captain Call had his eyes fixed on it. He seemed not to hear Dish's reply, although he was only a few feet away. Dish stepped out on the porch to see what it was that distracted the man. Far up the road he could see two horsemen coming, but they were so far yet that it was impossible to tell anything about them. At moments, heat waves from the road caused a quavering that made them seem like one horseman. Dish squinted, but there was nothing special about the riders that his eye could detect. Yet the captain had not so much as turned his head since they appeared. Gus, come out here, the captain said. Augustus was busy cleaning his plate of honey, a process that involved several more biscuits. I'm eating, he said, though that was obvious. Come see who's coming, the captain said rather mildly, Dish thought. If it's Dietz, my watch is already set, Augustus said. Anyway, I don't suppose he's changed clothes, and if I have to see his old black knees sticking out of them old quilts he wears for pants, it's apt to spoil my digestion. Dietz is coming all right, Call said. The fact is, he ain't by himself. Well, the man's always aimed to marry, Augustus said. I imagine he just finally met up with that dark-complexioned lady I was referring to. He ain't met no lady, Call said with a touch of exasperation, who he's met as an old friend of ours. If you don't come here and look, I'll have to drag you. Augustus was about through with the biscuits anyway. He had to use a forefinger to capture the absolute last drop of honey, which was just as sweet licked off a finger as if when eaten on good sourdough biscuits. Newt, did you know honey is the world's purest food? He said, getting up. Newt had heard enough lectures on the subject to have already forgotten more than most people ever know about the properties of honey. He hurried his plate to the tub, more curious than Mr. Gus about who Dietz could have found. Yes, sir, I like it myself, he said, to cut short the talk of honey. Augustus was a step behind the boy, idly licking his forefinger. He glanced up the road to see what call could be so aroused about. Two riders were coming, the one on the left clearly Dietz, on the big white gelding they called Wishbone. The other rider rode a pacing bay. It took but a moment for recognition to strike. The rider seemed to slump a little in the saddle, in the direction of his horse's offside, a tendency peculiar to only one man he knew. Augustus was so startled that he made the mistake of running his sticky fingers through his own hair. Ah, God, Woodrow, he said, that there's Jake Spoon. Chapter 6 The name struck Newt like a blow, so much did Jake Spoon mean to him. As a very little boy, when his mother had still been alive, Jake Spoon was the man who came most often to see her. It had begun to be clear to him, as he turned over his memories, that his mother had been a whore like Lorena. But this realization tarnished nothing, least of all his memories of Jake Spoon. No man had been kinder, either to him or his mother. Her name had been Maggie. Jake had given him hard candy and pennies, and had set him on a pacing horse and given him his first ride. He had even had old Jesus the bootmaker make him his first pair of boots. And once when Jake won a lady's saddle in a card game, he gave the saddle to Newt and had the stirrups cut down to his size. Those were the days before order came to Lonesome Dove, when Captain Call and Augustus were still rangers, with responsibilities that took them up and down the border. Jake Spoon was a ranger, too, and in Newt's eyes, the most dashing of them all. He always carried a pearl-handled pistol and rode a pacing horse, easier on the seat, Jake claimed. The dangers of his profession seemed to sit lightly on him. But then the fighting gradually died down along the border, and the captain and Mr. Gus and Jake and P.I. and Dietz all quit rangering and formed the Hat Creek outfit. But the settled life seemed not to suit Jake, and one day he was just gone. No one was surprised, though Newt's mother was so upset by it that for a time he got a whipping every time he asked when Jake was coming back. 
The whippings didn't seem to have much to do with him, just with his mother's disappointment that Jake had left. Newt stopped asking about Jake, but he didn't stop remembering him. It was barely a year later that his mother died of fever. The captain and Augustus took him in, although at first they argued about him. At first, Newt missed his mother so much that he didn't care about the arguments. His mother and Jake were both gone, and arguments were not going to bring them back. But when the worst pain passed, and he began to earn his keep around the Hat Creek outfit by doing the numerous chores that the captain set him, he often drifted back in his mind to the days when Jake Spoon had come to see his mother. It seemed to him that Jake might even be his father, though everyone told him his name was Newt Dobbs, not Newt Spoon. Why it was Dobbs, and why everyone was so sure, was a puzzle to him, since no one in Lonesome Dove seemed to know anything about a Mr. Dobbs. It had not occurred to him to ask his mother while she was alive. Last names weren't used much around Lonesome Dove, and he didn't realize that the last name was supposed to come from the father. Even Mr. Gus, who would talk about anything, seemed to have no information about Mr. Dobbs. He went west when he shouldn't have, was his only comment on the man. Newt had never asked Captain Call to amplify that information. The captain preferred to volunteer what he wanted you to know. In his heart, though, Newt didn't believe in Mr. Dobbs. He had a little pile of stuff his mother had left, just a few beads and combs and a little scrapbook, and some cut-out pictures from magazines that Mr. Gus had been kind enough to save for him. And there was nothing about a Mr. Dobbs in the scrapbook and no picture of him amid the pictures though there was a scratchy picture of his grandfather, Maggie's father, who had lived in Alabama. If, as he suspected, there had been no Mr. Dobbs, or if he had just been a gentleman who stopped at the rooming house a day or two, they had lived in the rooming house when Maggie was alive, then it might be that Jake Spoon was really his father. Perhaps no one had informed him of it, because they thought it more polite to let Jake do so himself when he came back. Newt had always assumed Jake would come back, too. Scraps of news about him had blown back down the cow trails, word that he was a peace officer in Ogallala, or that he was prospecting for gold in the Black Hills. Newt had no idea where the Black Hills were, or how you went about finding gold in them, but one of the reasons he was eager to head north with a cow herd was the hope of running into Jake somewhere along the way. Of course, he wanted to wear a gun, and become a top hand, and have the adventure of the drive. Maybe they would even see Buffalo, though he knew there weren't many left. But underneath all his other hopes was the oldest yearning he had, one that could lie covered over for months and years and still be fresh as a toothache, the need to see Jake Spoon. Now the very man was riding toward them, right there beside Dietz, on a pacing horse as pretty as the one he had ridden away ten years before. Newt forgot Dish Bagot, whose every move he had been planning to study. Before the two riders even got very close, Newt could see Dietz's big white teeth shining in his black face, for he had gone away on a routine job and was coming back proud of more than having done it. He didn't race his horse up to the porch or do anything silly, but it was plain, even at a distance, that Dietz was a happy man. Then the horses were kicking up little puffs of dust in the wagon yard and the two were almost there. Jake wore a brown vest and a brown hat, and he still had his pearl-handled pistol. Dietz was still grinning. They rode right up to the back porch before they drew rein. It was obvious that Jake had come a long way, for the pacing bay had no flesh on him. Jake's eyes were the color of coffee, and he wore a little mustache. He looked them all over for a moment, and then broke out a slow grin. Howdy, boys, he said. What's for breakfast? Why, biscuits and fatback, Jake, Augustus said. The usual fare, only we won't be serving it up for about 24 hours. I hope you've got a buffalo liver or a haunch of venison on you to tide you over. Gus, don't tell me you vet, Jake said, swinging off the bay. We rode all night, and Dietz couldn't think of nothing to talk about except the taste of them biscuits you make. While you was talking, Gus was eating them, Call said. He and Jake shook hands, looking one another over. Jake looked at Dietz a minute. I knowed we should have telegraphed from Pickles Gap, he said, then turned with a grin and shook Gus's hand. You always was a hog, Gus, Jake said. And you were usually late for meals, Augustus reminded him. 
Then P.I. insisted on shaking hands, though Jake had never been very partial to him. By gosh, Jake, you stayed gone a while, P.I. said. While they were shaking, Jake noticed the boy standing there by some lank cowhand with a heavy mustache. My lord, he said, are you little Newt? Why, you've plum growed. Who let that happen? Newt felt so full of feeling that he could hardly speak. It's me, Jake, he said. I'm still here. What do you think, Captain? Dietz asked, handing Call the receipt from the bank. Didn't I find the prodigal? You found him, Call said. I bet he wasn't in church either. Dietz had a laugh at that. No, sir, he said. Not in church. Jake was introduced to Dish Boggett, but once he shook hands, he turned and had another look at Newt, as if the fact that he was nearly grown surprised him more than anything else in Lonesome Dove. I swear, Jake, Augusta said, looking at the bay horse, you've rode that horse right down to the bone. Give him a good feed, Dietz, Call said. I judge it's been a while since he's had one. Dietz led the horses off toward the roofless barn. It was true that he made his pants out of old quilts, for reasons that no one could get him to explain. Colorful as they were, quilts weren't the best material for riding through mesquite and chaparral. Thorns had snagged the pants in several places, and cotton ticking was sticking out. For headgear, Dietz wore an old cavalry cap he had found somewhere. It was in nearly as bad shape as Lippy's bowler. Didn't he have that cap when I left? Jake asked. He took his own hat off and slapped the dust off his pants leg with it. He had curly black hair, but Newt saw to his surprise that there was a sizable bald spot on the top of his head. He found that cap in the fifties, to the best of my recollection, Augusta said. You know, Dietz is like me. He's not one to quit on a garment just because it's got a little age. We can't all be fine dresses like you, Jake. Jake turned his coffee eyes on Augustus and broke out another slow grin. What did it take to get you to whip up another batch of them biscuits, he said. I've come all the way from Arkansas without tasting a good bite of bread. From the looks of that pony, it's been fast traveling, Call said, which was as close to prying as he intended to get. He had run with Jake Spoon off and on for twenty years and liked him well, but the man had always worried him a little underneath. There was no more likable man in the West, and no better rider, either. But riding wasn't everything, and neither was likableness. Something in Jake didn't quite stick. Something wasn't quite consistent. He could be the coolest man in the company in one fight, and in the next be practically worthless. Augustus knew it, too. He was a great sponsor of Jake's, and had stayed fond of him, although for years they were rivals for Clara Allen, who eventually showed them both the door. But Augustus felt, with call, that Jake wasn't long on backbone. When he left the Rangers, Augustus said more than once that he would probably end up hung. So far, that hadn't happened. But riding up at breakfast time on a gant horse was an indication of trouble. Jake prided himself on pretty horses, and would never ride a horse as hard as the bay had been ridden if trouble wasn't somewhere behind him. Jake saw Bolivar coming from the old cistern with a bucket full of water, Bolivar was a new face, and one that had no interest in his homecoming. A little cool water sloshed over the edges of the bucket, looking very good to a man with a mouth as dusty as Jake's. Boys, I'd like a drinkin', maybe even a wash if you can spare one, he said. My luck's been running kind of muddy lately, but I'd like to get water enough in me that I can at least spit before I tell you about it. Why, sure, Augustus said. Go fill the dipper. You want us to stay out here and hold off the posse? There ain't no posse, Jake said, going in the house. Dish Boggett felt somewhat at a loss. He had been all ready to hire on, and then this new man rode up, and everybody had sort of forgotten him. Captain Call, a man known for being all business, seemed a little distracted. He and Gus just stood there as if they expected a posse, despite what Jake Spoon had said. Newt noticed it, too. Mr. Gus ought to go in and cook Jake some biscuits, but he just stood there thinking about something, evidently. Dietz was on his way back from the lots. Dish finally spoke up. Captain, like I said, I'd be glad to wait if you have some plans to make up a herd, he said. The captain looked at him strangely, as if he might have forgotten his name, much less what he was doing there, but it wasn't the case. Why, yes, Dish, he said. 
We might be needing some hands, if you don't mind doing some well digging while you wait. P, you best get these boys started. Dish was almost ready to back out then and there. He had drawn top wages for the last two years without being asked to do anything that couldn't be done from a horse. It was insensitive of the captain to think that he could just order him off with a boy and an old idiot like P.I. to wrestle a spade and crowbar all day. It scratched his pride, and he had a notion to get on his horse and let them keep their well digging. But the captain was looking at him hard, and when Dish looked up to say he had changed his mind, their eyes met and Dish didn't say it. There had been no real promises made, much less talk of wages, but somehow Dish had taken one step too far. The captain was looking at him eye to eye, as if to see if he was going to stand by his own words, or if he meant to wiggle like a fish and change his mind. Dish had only offered to stay because of Laurie, but suddenly it had all gotten beyond her. P and Newt were already walking toward the barn. It was clear from the captain's attitude that unless he wanted to lose all reputation, he had trapped himself into at least one day's well digging. It seemed to him he ought to at least say something to salvage a little pride. But before he could think of anything, Gus came over and clapped him on the shoulder. You should have rode on last night, Dish, he said with an irritating grin. You may never see the last of this outfit now. Well, you was the one that invited me, Dish said, highly annoyed. Since there was no help for it, short of disgrace, he started for the lots. If you come to China, you can stop digging, Augustus called after him. That's the place where the men wear pigtails. I wouldn't ride him if I were you, Call said. We may need him. I didn't send him off to dig no well, Augustus said. Don't you know that's an insult to his dignity? I'm surprised he went. I thought Dish had more grit. He said he'd stay, Call said. I ain't feeding him three times a day to sit around and play cards with you. No need to now, Augustus said. I got Jake for that. I bet you don't get Jake down in your well. At that moment, Jake stepped out on the back porch. His sleeves rolled up, and his face red from the scrubbing he had given it with the old piece of sacking they used for a towel. That old pistol arrow's been cleaning his gun on this towel, Jake said. It's filthy dirty. If it's just a six-shooter he's cleaning on it, you oughtn't to complain, Augustus said. There's worse things he could wipe on it. Hell, don't you men ever wash? Jake asked. That old mex didn't even want to give me a pan of water. It was the kind of remark Call had no patience with, but that was Jake, more interested in fancy arrangements than in the more important matters. Once you left, our standards slipped, Augustus said. The majority of this outfit ain't interested in refinements. That's plain, Jake said. There's a damn pig on the back porch. What about them biscuits? Much as I've missed you, I ain't overworking my sourdough just because you and Dietz couldn't manage to get here in time, Augustus said. What I will do is fry some meat. He fried it, and Jake and Dietz ate it, while Bolivar sat in the corner and sulked at the thought of two more breakfasts to wash up after. It amused Augustus to watch Jake eat. He was so fastidious about it. But the sight put Call into a black fidget. Jake could spend twenty minutes picking at some eggs and a bit of bacon. It was obvious to Augustus that Call was trying to be polite and let Jake get some food in his belly before he told his story. But Call was not a patient man, and had already controlled his urge to get to work longer than was usual. He stood in the door watching the whitening sky and looking restless enough to bite himself. So, where have you been, Jake? Augustus asked to speed things up. Jake looked thoughtful, as he almost always did. His coffee-colored eyes always seemed to be traveling leisurely over scenes from his own past, and they gave the impression that he was a man of sorrows, an impression very appealing to the ladies. It disgusted Augustus a little that ladies were so taken in by Jake's big eyes. In fact, Jake Spoon had had a perfectly easy life, doing mostly just what he pleased and keeping his boots clean. What his big eyes concealed was a slow-working brain. Basically, Jake just dreamed his way through life and somehow got by with it. Oh, I've been seeing the country, he said. I was up to Montana two years ago. I guess that's what made me decide to come back, although I've been meaning to get back down this way and see you boys for some years. Call came back in the room and straddled a chair, figuring he might as well hear it. 
What's Montana got to do with us, he asked. Why, Carl, you ought to see it, Jake said. A prettier country never was. How far'd you go, Augustus asked. Way up, past the Yellowstone, Jake said. I was near to the Milk River. You can smell Kennedy from there. I bet you can smell Indians, too, Carl said. How'd you get past the Cheyenne? They shipped most of them out, Jake said. Some of the Blackfeet are still troublesome, but I was with the Army doing a little scouting. That hardly made sense. Jake Spoon might scout his way across a card table, but Montana was something else. When'd you take to scouting? Call asked dryly. Oh, I was just with a feller taking some beef to the Blackfeet, Jake said. The Army came along to help. A lot of damn help the Army would be driving beef, Gus said. They helped us keep our hair, Jake said, laying his knife and fork across his plate as neatly as if he were eating at a fancy table. My main job was to scare the buffalo out of the way, he said. Buffalo, Augustus said. I thought they was about gone. Pshaw, Jake said. I must have seen 50,000 up above the Yellowstone. The damn buffalo hunters ain't got the guts to take on them Indians. Oh, they'll finish them once the Cheyenne and the Sioux finally cave in. And they may have even since I left. The damn Indians have the grass of Montana all to themselves. And has it got grass? Call, you ought to see it. I'd go today if I could fly, Call said. Be safer to walk, Augustus said. By the time we walked up there, maybe they would have licked the Indians. That's just it, boys, Jake said. The minute they're licked, there's going to be fortunes made in Montana. Why, it's cattle land like you've never seen, Call. High grass and plenty of water. Chilly, though, ain't it? Augustus asked. Oh, it's got weather, Jake said. Hell, a man can wear a coat. Better yet, a man can stay inside, Augustus said. I've yet to see a fortune made inside, Call said, except by a banker, and we ain't bankers. What did you have in mind, Jake? Getting to it first, Jake said. Round up some of these free cattle and take them on up. Beat all the other sons of bitches and we'd soon be rich. Augustus and Call exchanged looks. It was odd talk to be hearing from Jake Spoon, who had never been known for his ambition, much less for a fondness for cows. Pretty whores, pacing horses, and lots of clean shirts had been his main requirements in life. Why, Jake, what reformed you? Gus asked. You was never a man to hanker after fortune. Living with the cows from here to Montana would mean a change in your habits, if I remember them right, Call said. Jake grinned his slow grin. You boys, he said, you got me down for lazier than I am. I ain't no lover of cow shit and trail dust, I admit. But I've seen something that you haven't seen. Montana. Just because I like to play cards don't mean I can't smell an opportunity when one's right under my nose. Why, you boys ain't even got a barn with a roof on it. I doubt it would bust you to move. Jake, if you ain't something, Augustus said, here we ain't seen hide nor hair of you for ten years, and now you come riding in and want us to pack up and go north to get scalped. Well, Gus, me and Carl are going bald anyway, Jake said. You're the only one whose hair they'd want. All the more reason not to carry it to a hostile land, Augustus said. Why don't you just calm down and play cards with me for a few days? Then when I've won all your money, we'll talk about going places. Jake whittled down a match and began to meticulously pick his teeth. By the time you clean me, Montana will be all settled up, he said. I don't clean quick. What about that horse? Call asked. You didn't gant him like that just so that you could get here and help us beat the rush to Montana. What's this about your luck running thick? Jake looked a little more sorrowful as he picked his teeth. Killed a dentist, he said. A pure accident. But I killed him. Where'd this happen? Call asked. Fort Smith, Arkansas, Jake said, not three weeks ago. Well, I've always considered dentistry a dangerous profession, Augustus said. Making a living by yanking people's teeth out is asking for trouble. He wasn't even pulling my tooth, Jake said. I didn't even know there was a dentist in the town. I got in a little argument in a saloon, and a damn mule skinner threw down on me. Somebody's old buffalo rifle was leaning against the wall right by me, and that's what I went for. Hell, I was sitting on my own pistol. I never wouldn't have got to it in time. 
I wasn't even playing cards with the mule skinner. What riled him then, Gus asked. Whiskey, Jake said. He was bull drunk. Before I even noticed, he took a dislike to my dress and pulled his colt. Well, I don't know what took you to Arkansas in the first place, Jake, Augustus said. A fancy dresser like yourself is bound to excite comment in them parts. Call had found over the years that it only did to believe half of what Jake said. Jake was not a bald liar, but once he thought over a scrape, his imagination sort of worked on it and shaded it in his own favor. If the man pointed a gun at you and you shot him, then that was self-defense, Call said. I still don't see where the dentist comes in. It was bad luck all around, Jake said. I never even shot the mule skinner. I did shoot, but I missed, which was enough to scare him off. But of course I shot that darn buffalo gun. It was just a little plank saloon we were sitting in. A plank won't stop a fifty caliber bullet. Neither will a dentist, Augustus observed. Not unless you shoot down on him from the top. And even then I expect the bullet would come out his foot. Call shook his head. Augustus could think of the damnedest things. So where was the dentist, he asked. Walking along on the other side of the street, Jake said. They got big, wide streets in that town, too. But not wide enough, I guess, Call said. Nope, Jake said. We went to the door to watch the mule skinner run off and saw the dentist laying over there dead, fifty yards away. He had managed to get in the exact wrong spot. P done the same thing once, Augustus said. Remember Woodrow? Up in the Wichita country. P shot at a wolf and missed, and the bullet went over a hill and killed one of our horses. I won't forget that, Call said. It was little Billy it killed. I hated to lose that horse. Of course, we couldn't convince P he'd done it, Augustus said. He don't understand trajectory. Well, I understand it, Jake said. Everybody in town liked that dentist. Ah, oh, Jake, that won't stick, Augustus said. Nobody really likes dentists. This one was the mayor, Jake said. Well, it was accidental death, Call said. Yeah, but I'm just a gambler, Jake said. They all like to think they're respectable back in Arkansas. Besides, the dentist's brother was the sheriff, and somebody told him I was a gunfighter. He invited me to leave town a week before it happened. Call sighed. All the gunfighter business went back to one lucky shot Jake had made when he was a mere boy starting out in the Rangers. It was funny how one shot could make a man's reputation like that. It was a hip shot Jake made because he was scared, and it killed a Mexican bandit who was riding toward them on a dead run. It was Call's opinion, and Augustus's too, that Jake hadn't even been shooting at the bandit. He was probably shooting in hopes of bringing down the horse, which might have fallen on the bandit and crippled him a little. But Jake shot blind from the hip, with the sun in his eyes to boot, and hit the bandit right in the Adam's apple, a thing not likely to occur more than once in a lifetime, if that often. But it was Jake's luck that most of the men who saw him make the shot were raw boys, too, with not enough judgment to appreciate how lucky a thing it was. Those that survived and grew up told the story all across the West, so there was hardly a man from the Mexican border to Canada who hadn't heard what a dead pistol shot Jake Spoon was. Though any man who had fought with him through the years would know he was no shot at all with a pistol, and only a fair shot with a rifle. Call and Augustus had always worried about Jake because of his unearned reputation, but he was a lucky fellow, and there were not many men around dumb enough to enjoy pistol fights, so Jake managed to get by. It was ironic that the shot which finally got him in trouble was as big an accident as the shot that had made his fame. How'd you get loose from the sheriff, Call asked. He was gone when it happened, Jake said. He was up in Missouri, testifying on some stage robbers. I don't know if he's even back to Fort Smith yet. They wouldn't have hung you for an accident, even in Arkansas, Call said. I am a gambler, but that's one I didn't figure to gamble on, Jake said. I just went out the back door and left, hoping July would get too busy to come after me. July's the sheriff, Gus asked. Yes, July Johnson, Jake said. He's young, but he's determined. I just hope he gets busy. I don't know why a lawman would want a dentist for a brother, Augustus said rather absently. If he warned you out of the town, you should have left, Call said. There's plenty of other towns besides Fort Smith. 
Jake probably had him a whore, Augustus said. He usually does. You're one to talk, Gus, Jake said. They all fell silent for a time while Jake thoughtfully picked his teeth with the sharpened match. Bolivar was sound asleep, sitting on his stool. I should have rode on, Carl, Jake said apologetically, but Fort Smith's a pretty town. It's on the river, and I like to have a river running by me. They eat catfish down there. It got where it kind of suited my tooth. I'd like to see the fish that could keep me in a place I wasn't wanted, Carl said. Jake had always been handy with excuses. That's what we'll tell the sheriff when he shows up to take you back, Augustus said. Maybe he'll take you fishing while you're waiting to be hung. Jake let it pass. Gus would have his joke, and he and Carl would disapprove of him when he got in some unlucky scrape. It had always been that way, but the three of them were compañeros still, no matter how many dentists he killed. Carl and Gus had been the law themselves, and didn't always bow and scrape to it. They would not likely let some young sheriff take him off to hang because of an accident. He was willing to take a bit of ribbing. When trouble came, if it did, the boys would stick, and July Johnson would have to ride back home empty-handed. He stood up and walked to the door to look over the hot, dusty little town. I hardly thought find you boys still here, he said. I thought you'd have some big ranch somewhere by now. This town was a two-bit town when we came here, and it looks to me like it's lost about 15 cents since then. Who's left that we all know? Xavier and Lippy, Augustus said. Therese got killed, thank God. A few of the boys are left, but I forget who. Tom Bynum's left. He would be, Jake said. The Lord looks after fools like Tom. What do you hear of Clara? I suppose since you traveled the world, you've been to see her. Dropped in for supper, innocent-like, I guess. Call stood up to go. He had heard enough to know why Jake had come back and didn't intend to waste the day listening to him jaw about his travels, particularly not if it meant having to hear any talk about Clara Allen. He had heard enough about Clara in the old days when Gus and Jake had both been courting her. He had been quite happy to think it all ended when she married, but it hadn't ended and listening to Gus pine over her was almost as bad as having him and Jake fighting about her. Now, with Jake back, it would all start again, though Clara Allen had been married and gone for over fifteen years. Dietz stood up when Call did, ready for work. He hadn't said a word while eating, but it was clear he took much pride in being the one who had seen Jake first. Well, it ain't a holiday, Call said. Work to do. Me and Dietz will go see if we can help them boys. That newt surprised me, Jake said. I had it in mind he was still a spud. Is Maggie still here? Maggie's been dead nine years, Augustus said. You wasn't hardly over the hill when it happened. I swear, Jake said. You mean you've had little newt for nine years? There was a long silence in which only Augustus felt comfortable. Dietz felt so uncomfortable that he stepped in front of the captain and went out the door. Why, yes, Jake, Gus said. We've had him since Maggie died. I swear, Jake said again. It was the only Christian thing, Augustus said. Taking him in, I mean. After all, one of you boys is more than likely his pa. Call put on his hat, picked up his rifle, and left them to their talk. Chapter 7 Jake Spoon stood in the door of the low house, watching Call and Dietz head for the barn. He had been looking forward to being home from the moment he looked out the door of the saloon and saw the dead man laying in the mud across the wide main street of Fort Smith. But now that he was home, it came back to him how nervous things could be if Call wasn't in his best mood. Dietz's pants are a sight, ain't they? he said mildly. Seems to me he used to dress better. Augustus chuckled. He used to dress worse, he said. Why, he had that sheepskin coat for fifteen years. You couldn't get in five feet of him without the lice jumping on you. It was because of that coat that we made him sleep in the barn. I ain't finicky except when it comes to lice. What happened to it? Jake asked. I burned it, Augustus said. Done it one summer when Dietz was off on a trip with Call. I told him a buffalo hunter stole it. Dietz was ready to track him and get his coat back, but I talked him out of it. Well, it was his coat, Jake said. I don't blame him. 
Hell, Dietz didn't need it, Augustus said. It ain't cold down here. Dietz was just attached to it because he had it so long. You remember when we found it, don't you? He was along. I may have been along, but I don't remember, Jake said, lighting a smoke. We found that coat in an abandoned cabin up on the Brazos, Augustus said. I guess the settlers that run out decided it was too heavy to carry. It weighed as much as a good-sized sheep, which is why Carl gave it to Dietz. He was the only one of us stout enough to carry it all day. Don't you remember that, Jake? It was the time we had that scrape up by Fort Phantom Hill. I remember a scrape, but the rest is kind of cloudy, Jake said. I guess all you boys have got to do is sit around and talk about old times. I'm young yet, Gus. I got a living to make. In fact, what he did remember was being scared every time they crossed the Brazos, since it would just be ten or twelve of them and no reason not to think they would run into a hundred Comanches or Kiowas. He would have been glad to quit rangering if he could have thought of a way to do it that wouldn't look bad. But there was no way. In the end, he came through twelve Indian fights and many scrapes with bandits only to get in real trouble in Fort Smith, Arkansas, as safe a town as you could find. Now that he had come back, it was just to be reminded of Maggie, who had always threatened to die if he ever left her. Of course, he had thought it just girlish talk, the kind of thing all women said when they were trying to hold a fella. Jake had heard such talk all the way up the trail, in San Antonio and Fort Worth, Abilene and Dodge, in Ogallala and Miles City, the talk of horrors pretending to be in love for one. But Maggie had actually died, when he had only supposed she would just move on to another town. It was a sad memory to come home to, though from what he knew of the situation, Call had done her even worse than he had. Jake, I notice you've not answered me about Clara, Augusta said. If you've been to see her, I'd like to hear about it, even though I begrudge you every minute. Oh, you ain't got much begrudging to do, Jake said. I just seen her for a minute outside a store in Ogallala. That darn Bob was with her, so all I could do was tip my hat and say good morning. I swear, Jake, I thought you'd have more gumption than that, Augusta said. They live up in Nebraska, do they? Yes, on the North Platte, Jake said. Why, he's the biggest horse trader in the territory. The army gets most of its horses from him. What army's in those parts? And the army wears out a lot of horses. I reckon he's close to rich. Any young'uns? Augustus asked. Two girls, I believe, Jake said. I heard her boys died. Bob wasn't too friendly. I wasn't asked to supper. Even old dumb Bob's got enough sense to keep the likes of you away from Clara, Augustus said. How did she look? Clara? Jake said. Not as pretty as she once was. I guess it's a hard life up in Nebraska, Gus said. After that, neither of them had any more to say for a few minutes. Jake thought it ill-spoken of Gus to bring Clara up, a woman he no longer had any sympathy for since she had shown him the door and married a big dumb horse trader from Kentucky. Even losing her to Gus wouldn't have been so bitter a blow since Gus had been her beau before he met her. Augustus felt his own pangs, irked mainly that Jake had had a glimpse of Clara, whereas he himself had to make do with an occasional scrap of gossip. At sixteen, she had been so pretty it took your breath, and smart, too, a girl with some sand, as she had quickly shown when both her parents had been killed in the big Indian raid of fifty-six, the worst ever to rake that part of the country. Clara had been in school in San Antonio when it happened, but she came right back to Austin and ran the store her parents had started. The Indians had tried to set fire to it, but for some reason it didn't catch. Augustus felt he might have won her that year, but as luck would have it, he was married then to his second wife. And by the time she died, Clara had developed such an independent mind that winning her was no longer an easy thing. In fact, it proved an impossible thing. She wouldn't have him, or Jake either, and yet she married Bob Allen, a man so dumb he could hardly walk through a door without bumping his head. They soon went north. Since then, Augustus had kept his ears open for news that she was widowed. He didn't wish Clara any unpleasantness, but... Horse trading in Indian country was risky business, 
If Bob should meet an untimely end, as better men had, then he wanted to be the first to offer his assistance to the widow. That Bob Allen's lucky, he remarked. I've known horse traders who didn't last a year. Why, hell, you're a horse trader yourself, Jake said. You boys have let yourselves get stuck. You should have gone north long ago. There's plenty of opportunity left up north. That may be, Jake. But all you've done with it is kill a dentist, Augustus said. At least we ain't committed no ridiculous crimes. Jake smiled. Have you got anything to drink around here? he asked. Or do you just sit around all day with your throat parched? He gets drunk, Bolivar said, waking up suddenly. Augustus stood up. Let's go for a stroll, he said. This man don't like folks idling in his kitchen after a certain hour. They walked out into the hot morning. The sky was already white. Bolivar followed them out, picking up a rawhide lariat that he kept on a pile of firewood back by the porch. They watched him walk off into the chaparral, the rope in his hand. That old pistolero ain't very polite, Jake said. Where's he going with that rope? I didn't ask him, Gus said. He went around to the spring house, which was empty of rattlesnakes for once. It amused him to think how annoyed Call would be when he came up at noon and found them both drunk. He handed Jake the jug, since he was the guest. Jake uncorked it and took a modest swig. Now, if we had some shade to drink this in, we'd be in good shape, Jake said. I don't suppose there's a sporting woman in this town, is there? You are a scamp, Augusta said, taking the jug. Are you so rich that's all you can think about? I can think about it, rich or poor, Jake said. They squatted in the shade of the spring house for a bit, their backs against the adobe, which was still cool on the side the sun hadn't struck. Augusta saw no need to mention Lorena, since he knew Jake would soon discover her for himself and probably have her in love with him within the week. The thought of Dish Boggett's bad timing made him smile, for it was certain Jake's return would doom whatever chance Dish might have had. Dish had committed himself to a day of well-digging for nothing, for when it came to getting women in love with him, Jake Spoon had no equal. His big eyes convinced them that he'd be lost without them, and none of them seemed to want him just to go on and be lost. While they were squatting by the spring house, the pigs came nosing around the house looking for something to eat. But there wasn't so much as a grasshopper in the yard. They stopped and looked at Augustus a minute. Get on down to the saloon, he said. Maybe you'll find Lippy's hat. 